The brook trout is West Virginia's only native salmonid. We like to say they've been West Virginia state fish for over 20,000 years. Historically, brook trout were found throughout the main stem rivers fluently, but they've been fragmented over time due to poor land management practices by us. We are seeing fish in the 14 to 16 inch range on a pretty frequent basis now. Um, I like to say that uh, I have a goal that's about 20 inches long. That's a good cast. Ooh. Ooh. He actually ate it. I didn't think he's going to hit. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> God, I love it. Oh, oh buddy. <laughs> this is Dustin Wichterman. He has become a good buddy of mine over the past year and has devoted his career and the better part of his life to trout conservation and habitat improvement. Dustin is the Associate Director of Trout Unlimited's Mid-Atlantic Cold Water Program and one of the only people I know who has caught a confirmed 15-inch native brook trout. And not just one, he's caught several. This man knows his stuff, so if you're a brookie fisherman or just someone who's interested in the Ice Age relic, then you'll want to watch this video. So we're standing in the Monongahela National Forest right now amongst one of our project areas where we've treated over 17 miles of the main stem of this small tributary. This is a large wood material structure here. It was installed with a hydraulic excavator with a thumb on it and it's designed to constrict the water's flow, place it into the center of the channel and create a scour pool over time. Uh, this wood material also collects all the natural wood as it's flowing through the system, provides a lot of good food for the fish that live here. So as we work from the top of the watershed downstream, we work seamlessly across public and private lands because brook trout and all fish do not see political boundaries. So we need to address all of the resource concerns that these fish encounter in order to be effective at bringing their populations up and restoring these ecosystems. There we go. Oh. Boy, that fish swung at it like six times. Here we go. Beautiful little brook trout here. And I caught it out of one of the log jams that Trout Unlimited made. So there you go, it works. I'm gonna go up here and release him where I caught him. Oh. There you go, buddy. Thanks for playing. The reason that we're adding wood into these systems is because the forest that's around us right now is relatively young. Um, in the early 1900s, most of West Virginia was logged um, kind of throughout the entire state. And so these trees that are here are really not mature enough to be falling into this stream on a regular basis on their own. As these hillsides were logged, these streams basically cut their way down into these valleys and incised. And what it did was it caused the water to run off faster, you have less pools, you're engaging a lot more bedrock. That's right folks, if you've ever been to West Virginia, most of the trees you see aren't even 100 years old. West Virginia had one of the greatest stands of red spruce in the world before it was cut and burned to bedrock in the early 1900s. Dolly Sod, Spruce Knob, and other famous areas in the highlands of West Virginia had red spruce trees 60 to 90 feet tall. The floor of these massive forests were covered in several feet of decomposing plant matter that created a pH buffer for the creeks and rivers that flowed through them. But it wasn't just West Virginia's highlands that got clear cut. Out of the 16 million acres of original forest in West Virginia, only 283 acres weren't cut. 
It's hard for people in today's world to even fathom what the forest looked like before it was logged, let alone the kind of trout these creeks would have held. What we're trying to do is speed up the process for nature just a little bit and add wood into the system, which will slow the water's velocity. It'll drive the energy of that water into the stream bottom, as well as it'll reconnect our floodplains and create a healthier ecosystem that's more resilient to these high flow events that we see on, on a more frequent basis than what we've seen um, you know, in documented history thus far. There's a the fish boys. Decent looking one. There's no color to him, which I'm a little surprised with. But oh no. Well, I was gonna release him more properly, but I guess that'll work. Oh, that's a nicer one. That's a good one. Come here, buddy. Ooh. Some folks are a little uneasy when they see this type of work because they fished a watershed their entire life and it doesn't look the same way that it did when they grew up there. However, you know, this wood is a natural part of the system. Wood is good. We have documented four-fold increases in brook trout abundance in a lot of these watersheds where we're doing this work. So we're seeing the benefits of the work and we're reaping those benefits as we're out here today trying to catch these fish off the back of these large wood complexes. That's a cast. Nope. Couldn't have been very big. Oh, come on. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, man. Looks like a good one, oh, is it? It is a good one. Oh, that's a beautiful fish. Oh, dude. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> wow oh yes yeah there <laughs> that is a beautiful fish you know what we're faced with today are these isolated pockets of brook trout uh, in brook trout science we call them patches which means a genetically or genetically interconnected population of fish and so ultimately what we're trying to do is reconnect these patches so these brook trout are able to move from these smaller tributary systems down into the main stem and back up into the headwaters where they'll spawn. Um, as we do that, we tend to see larger fish. Uh, you know, they basically leave these smaller, less productive areas, come down into these main stem systems like this, where there's a lot of forage food, and then move back up in later on season. You know, we are seeing fish in the 14 to 16 inch range on a pretty frequent basis now. Um, I like to say that uh, I have a goal, it's about 20 inches long. So I hope that one day we're able to see 20 inch fish moving throughout these systems. And we're really not far from that now. So I feel like it could happen at least within my lifetime. <laughs> there you're good there's some big fish rising in here really or they look like they would be big fish 
This is so deep right here, but there's like two rock ledges that come together. Man, they're rising, but they ain't even what I got going on. Nice one. Real nice one. Oh yeah. Can you not fight that way, please? Oh yeah, that's a big one. That, that might be, he's, he's up there. Yep. He's up there. Oh, it took enough cast, man. I can see them rise, but they are being stubborn in this low water. Gentlemen, here's fish of the day for sure. He's not like super happy that I've caught him. Dude, he's, he's not super thrilled with me, but look at that fish. Come on now, look at that thing. That is incredible. So this project was put in about 2015. It's one of my favorite projects of all time. Um, really, before we started out here, the stream bank was over, or the stream uh, bottom was over wide. This bank was completely eroding behind us and just sloughing off into the channel, dropping out three or four feet of material every year. Um, really, the, we went through and did some fishery surveys out here, didn't pick up any brook trout or really uh, any other, other trout either. Um, came in, uh, worked with the landowner, uh, put in some trough systems, excluded livestock from the main stem of the river. We put some tow wood at the, at the base of this slope here, as well as a rock vein up above me. Replanted the vegetation on the sides with willows and sycamores and maple trees. It just started to come back and beautiful fashion you can see behind. So as I said, it's one of my favorite projects on the river. Um, the first year we put this job in, I got a photograph of the landowner's son with a big old fat trout. And they just had a huge smile on their face too. So it's really what you want to see. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. That looked like a good fish. I'm going for it. I don't even know where that went. Oh. Oh God! Jeez! Oh no! Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Look at the colors. This is what we we're here for, dude. I mean, look at that. Look at the colors on that thing. So what you can see behind me is kind of a typical scene that we'll see throughout our project area. We have a perched culvert here, um, which is actually undersized for the amount of water that the system sees when the flows are a lot higher. And the way that you can tell that is you see this large scour pool behind me. And what happens is the, those culverts create almost a fire hose effect, like when you stick your finger on the end of a, fi or a, a water hose and cause the water to spray out. And so it creates this large scour. And what it does is it disconnects our brook trout populations from being able to move up into the headwaters where they like to spawn. And so in order to have healthy populations of brook trout, you want interconnected systems. So Trout Unlimited is working across the Potomac headwaters as well as the Greenbrier and the Dolly in West Virginia to remove these undersized structures, replace them with larger bridge or span structures that are more passable by vehicle and fish traffic during all flow events. So really it's a win-win for the communities because you're investing in the infrastructure around the stream, you're investing in the resources that are here for the people, and creating sustainable fisheries for all to enjoy. Brook trout need to be able to make it into the headwaters. A single fish can move up to six miles in a day. We've documented that here in West Virginia. And so by removing these undersized structures and replacing them, you're reconnecting that entire water fish. After fishing with Dustin for a few days and soaking up as much information as I could, our weekend was finally coming to a close. 
but I had one last question. So why brook trout for me is an extremely deep question. Um, and, and that really does take a lot of thought to, to answer accurately. Um, I would say that brook trout to me, they just represent this, this purity that's almost indescribable. Um, when I'm in a brook trout stream and I'm, I'm walking into the back country somewhere, the feeling that's in my heart naturally is, is almost, it's unexplainable what, what it brings to me. Um, it's not just about the fish, it's about the places that they live. And as I've told all of my friends, it's about what's around the next bend. And that's, that's what brook trout means to me, because you never know what you're gonna find in the areas that they live and call home. Not only is this video coming to an end, but so did our weekend. I'd like to give a huge shout out to Dustin for running around with me for an entire weekend and being a part of this video. It's always a pleasure to get to spend time on the water with someone that has the same passion that I do. If you've made it this far in the video, leave a comment and let me know what you thought about this video and if you'd like to see more in the future. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you guys on the next video.